I'd like you to imagine your dream life. See the version of you who has what you want to have, feels how you want to feel, and is who you want to be. I'm Brittany Hoops, your hypnotherapist and manifestation coach, and this is the show where I'll teach you to master the full power of your mind, to guide you on your journey towards destination manifestation. Uh, yeah, take a step back for the ones who can't do that. Hope I separate from my past. <laughs> Hello there. Oh my gosh. Reminds me of a Kristen wig from SNL. Oh my god. <laughs> it is so good to be back. First of all, I just have to take like a brief little moment and I just want to thank you all. I want to thank all the listeners who reached out after I shared that little life and manifestation update on the last episode. I'm just keeping it real with you guys. I just want to keep you up to date. I just want you to understand what a manifestation journey can look like. You all are literal angels on earth, so I so appreciate it. But I will say after this summer full of ups and downs, I launched the Be Confident in 30 Days course. I did so much soul searching. I really feel like I'm coming back to my roots, which is this beautiful show, which is you all, which is focusing back on one-on-one hypnotherapy and coaching. Of course, the course still exists. It's still there. It's evergreen. It's still available. But you just might not hear me talk about it quite as much unless it's like something that's spot on perfect for it. And I'm like, yeah, you guys check this out if that's what we're discussing. But otherwise, we're probably not going to address it too much on the show. It's it's already launched. And yeah, I'm just so happy to be back and teaching and talking to you. Because I would say personally, like I did some soul searching, right? And I'm like, okay, what? what do I need to be doing? Not what I should think I need to be doing, but what do I feel called to do? And I feel like what really lights my heart on fire is teaching at a very deep, deep level. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have noticed that lately I've been posting a whole lot more, which I'm really proud of myself about. Like, it's been fun. You know, it's fun to play around with a new medium and to try something new um, and to come up with creative ideas and whatnot. But man, oh man, that 90 second cap that Instagram puts on reels is just so hard. It's like torture, right? Like, how are you supposed to transform somebody's life with a 90 second little blip of understanding? I mean, at best, you could read or hear an inspiring quote. Like, that's, that's bare minimum that, you know, that you're able to accomplish or bare maximum. I think you're able to accomplish with that. And so I've been doing my darndest to pack as much manifestation goodness into those 90 seconds as I can. But here on this podcast, like, let's be honest, this is the good stuff, right? Like, this is the deep stuff. This is the stuff if you truly want to manifest and you want to learn, I'm sorry, it's just going to take you a few minutes to learn it. And I want to go deep with that. This is the transformational stuff. And so I'm so happy to be back teaching in this long form medium, because I just think that that's what your dreams deserve. And I want your dreams to have what they deserve. So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And honestly, it's the crux of what it takes to truly manifest. In fact, It's an area of manifestation that I feel like I kind of look around and, you know, to all the other teachers and authors and things like that. I'm like, why are more people not talking about this? I feel I feel like it doesn't get enough love for how important of an area it truly is. In fact, I'm so fascinated by it that last week I started the years long journey to write a book entirely about it, which I'm so excited about, guys. Like, this is my calling. Like, to be an author, a manifestation author, like, yes, that's a hell yes. Talk about doing some soul searching, like, that's what came up. So I'm sure you're going to hear me talk about this over the next several years (laughs) as I manifest this book into being. You're going to hear quite a a bit about it. But I'm right at the beginning stages right now. And what it's going to be about is the role of identity and self-concept and how crucially important those things are to your manifestation journey. 
And that's why I think most traditional goal setters, <laughs> notice how I'm doing like a robot <laughs> movement if you're watching the YouTube, and I can make fun of goal setters because, you know, back in my 20s, I used to be one of them, right? Before I realized that achieving your goals isn't just reliant on to-do lists and corporate conscious mind-driven processes and, you know, Gantt charts and... <laughs> And all the things, right? Now I realize that there's other things at play, like energy and emotion and subconscious universal processes at play, too. But traditional goal setters have trouble sticking with their goals and seeing them to fruition because they can't accept that you have to become the person that has the manifestation first. That is task uno, number one, right? In order to manifest that thing, or as they might say, to reach that goal, you have to become that person first. See, the old way of thinking, the traditional goal setter way of thinking is that, oh, I climb up this ladder and then I will be the person. They want the promotion and then they want to prove that they can do the job. Uh uh-uh. uh, life doesn't work that way. Energy just as simply doesn't work that way. You have to do the job first. You have to be the boss before you get that job title, before they'll make you the boss. That's just how it works. You have to prove it to yourself. You have to prove it to the universe. And I don't mean that in like um the universe is holding out on you until you prove it. No, you just have to embody the energy of it that makes you that energetic match. So the universe is like, oh, yeah, OK, boom, here, match. This goes for work, but of course, this is a metaphor that really applies to any manifestation in life. So there have been so many times in my life where this concept has proven to be true. Times where I used it purposefully and times where it just sort of happened naturally. But I sort of look back and I'm like, oh, yeah, I shifted my identity first, and then the manifestation fell into place. The biggest example I'll just share really briefly here is I remember in high school, I I was an actress, right? And we're going to be talking a lot about the, the parallels between acting and manifestation today. But I was an actress, and my school counselor wouldn't put me in the advanced acting class. And I knew that advanced acting was only given in sixth period, but they made me take like some gym class in sixth period for my graduation requirements. And I was like, uh uh-uh, uh, this isn't going to work. But he wasn't budging. He's like, nope, sorry, you're just going to have to miss acting this semester. And I was like, no, dude, you don't understand. I'm becoming a professional actress, I need to be in acting class. So when he wouldn't change my schedule, I took matters into my own hands. I became the version of me that was in in advanced acting. And so I forget what it was. I think I knew, okay, well, if advanced acting was going to be sixth period, then I needed gym to be fourth period. So I remember just going down into the basement where all the gym classes were held at my high school. And I remember walking down the hallway and kids were sort of leaving class right after the bell had rung. And I remember kind of flagging down a kid who was wearing some gym clothes. I figured they were probably coming from some gym class. And I said, did you just come from gym class? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, can you point me to which classroom this was? Because at the beginning of the school year, you would go into classroom before you'd actually meet at the gym. And he's like, yeah, sure. It's down the hallway to the left. I was like, okay, thank you. (laughs) So he directed me to where a gym class was being held. And I show up. There's a kid sitting in in the class. I was like, oh, is this like junior high gym? I just asked him, like, is this what this class is? They're like, yeah, sure. It is. So I just sat down. (laughs) Notice how I'm like finding my way to this gym class, right? I sit down. The gym teacher takes the role on the first day of school of class and they don't call my name, right? Because I'm supposed to be in some other class right now, but instead I'm, I am embodying the person who was in acting class in sixth period. And therefore I should be in gym right now. And then the gym teacher, you know, is like half checked out, right? He doesn't give an F <laughs> about his job. And he's like, is there anyone whose name I didn't call? And I just raise my hand, just matter of factly. I'm like, yep, I'm supposed to be in this class, you know? Brittany Richer, that's my name at the time before I was married. Brittany Richer. And he's like, okay. And he added my name to the class. 
<laughs> and that was that. Wouldn't you know, there was a spot. And wouldn't you know, I was able to be in advanced acting class when I needed to. And I didn't need the counselor to do it for me. I embodied the identity of who I needed to be to accomplish what I needed to do. And I let, I let the pieces fall into place to support that. So, you know, another, so that was kind of an example that I laugh about because I'm like, oh, I've been doing this identity work for years before I even realized what it was. Another top example I can think of is a story that I believe I've shared on the podcast before, so I'll keep it brief. But it's the story of how I manifested being on the hit TV show, Big Brother. So I knew I wanted to be on Big Brother. I decided I was going to try a different strategy to be on the show. I'd applied six times before. So I decided I was going to do something a little different the seventh time. And so nightly, I listened to the short little 10-minute self-hypnosis audio recording. And, you know, the power of this recording has proven itself multiple times to me for many hundreds of my clients. So this is a recording that every single one of my one-on-one hypnotherapy and coaching clients receive when they work with me. And there's a portion in this recording where we train new beliefs. And the belief I was training was, I'm a house guest on BB24. Now, I just want you to look at that thought, that affirmation, we might call it. That's a very identity-driven affirmation, is it not? It wasn't, I'm on the TV show, BB24, or it wasn't even, I'm going to win, BB24. (laughs) Although maybe I should have affirmed that one, looking back on it. Maybe that should have been it, because I did not win. I got close, but I did not win. Regardless, the affirmation I chose was, I am a house guest on BB24. It's who I am. It's part of my identity. It's not what I do. It's not what I have. It's not what I've accomplished. It's not what I achieved. It's just who I am. It's how I see myself to be. It's self-concept. And at first, oh, it felt so awkward. It felt so wrong. It felt like, have you ever gone like shopping with your friends? And they're like, oh, Brittany, 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 wear, pick out this outfit. This will look so cute, right? They pick out this outfit for, outfit for you. And like, it's kind of slutty and it's like way too low cut, <laughs> but they think you're going to look great in it. So you put it on and then you're just like, oh, this isn't me. Like I wear baseball caps. I don't wear heels and short skirts. <laughs> like That's not my style, right? It just feels wrong. It just doesn't feel like you, right? That's how thinking this thought at first felt to me. But I knew I needed to grow into that identity if that's what I really truly wanted to manifest. Because there's the difference between, oh, this isn't me or this is out of alignment of who I am at my core, like your soul core, versus this isn't me and who I am from like an ego driven place from like a fear driven place from like a fear of failure driven place you see what i mean like i knew in my soul that i was meant to be on that tv show it didn't feel right to think that thought right now because the ego was popping up with all these things of they won't pick you and you've applied six times why would they pick you now and you're getting too old and you're not skinny enough and all these ego driven fear thoughts that would give in the way but i knew in my soul that that is who I was meant to be. Now, I caution you from this, right? Because there may be some things that just don't feel like they're in soul alignment. But I would bet my bottom dollar that you would not have a dream associated with those things, a manifestation you want to manifest with those things if it wasn't with your soul alignment. Like, I'm trying to think of an identity that's not with my soul alignment. Like, being a criminal, I just really have no desire for, like, stealing luxury goods. It's just not really anything I care about or want to do. So to be a criminal does not feel like in soul alignment. Therefore, I don't have any dreams about that. I I don't think about manifesting a bunch of things for nothing, right? Like I I just doesn't doesn't even cross my mind. So I don't even think about it, right? So there's a distinction between there. Soul alignment versus ego misalignment 
in deciding, you know, and just because an identity might not feel familiar at first doesn't necessarily mean that it's not in soul alignment. Because I knew that Big Brother was in soul alignment, but it was the ego fears that I needed to retrain my brain and tame in order to embody that identity of what I truly wanted to manifest, who I really truly wanted to be. And that's what we do with hypnotherapy, right? It's a form of brain retraining. We use our conscious minds to decide who we want to be. We craft those new thoughts that then reflect the belief that we want to program, the new thought being I am house guest on BB24. And then we soften the subconscious mind through a series of relaxation, through a series of repetition again and again and again. We relax that subconscious mind so it's open and soft and receptive. It's just like, feed me new thoughts, please. And then we do. Through repetition, we think the new thought again and again and again. And that's where the subconscious mind begins to accept that said new belief. Now, fast forward several months. I don't actually remember the exact timeline of how long it took to retrain my brain in the Big Brother example. I just sort of told myself that I was going to retrain my brain until I walked into that house (laughs) and that was my reality. Even though I believed it was going to be my reality sooner, like, I mean, I think I started the brain training like, you know, three or four months at the beginning of the casting process. And I kept with it, even though I would say if I had to guess like a month or two in, I believed it. But I just kept with it because the casting process was still ongoing. Right. (laughs) So. Fast forward several months, by the time I was packing up, I was ready to go to the Big Brother house, boom, yeah, I'm a house guest on BB24. And I was excited to, like, hear it from the producers, to receive the confirmation, to receive my Big Brother key, which is sort of your rite of passage of going on the show. But I wasn't surprised. I was excited, but I wasn't surprised. And that's the energy space that you want to be in with your manifestations. Excited, but not surprised. It's my favorite mantra where you get to that place where it feels like, well, of course, because that means that it feels familiar, it feels safe, it feels accepted by your subconscious mind. It isn't this thing that's way out there for other people. No, it's for this person. It's for you. It's part of your identity. You celebrate, but by the time you receive that manifestation into your life, I'd say 99% of the celebration has already happened. <laughs> You've been celebrating every day in your inner mind through your visualizations, in your hypnotherapy, by feeling into preemptively how it would feel to have manifested that thing. Like I had felt how it was going to feel when I got onto Big Brother. I had felt that, gosh, I don't know. Let me do the math. Let's see if I did this like 40, four months, so four times like 30. I'd done this like 120 times. <laughs> I had celebrated being on Big Brother. And I only celebrated it once in 3D reality. But I celebrated 120 times in, you know, in the quantum 5D reality in my inner mind. So what would that be like? Let's see, one divided by 120. That means huh, not even 1% point eight (laughs) percent of my celebration happened, quote unquote, in real life, meaning in the 3D, meaning once it happened in our 3D reality, the whole other 99% of my celebration happened in my inner mind, happened in advance so that I could manifest the 1%, the less than 1%. That's why we have to do the inner work. The inner work is 99% of the work. The real life experience and celebration of it is less than 1%. And that was just, you know, an example of me, but that's really what it takes, right? So you really have to feel it, right? You have to feel into how it would truly feel to have manifested that thing. And when I say feel it, like, I mean, really feel it. Okay. Are you crying tears of joy during your hypnotherapy sessions? Now, if you're the kind of person who does cry tears of joy when something really joyous happens to you, like I totally am. (laughs) I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm happy. I'm crying when I'm hungry. You know, (laughs) I cry no matter what. 
right? Then you better be crying those real tears when you visualize in hypnotherapy or responding how you truly respond. I mean, you don't have to cry if you aren't a crier. I'm a happy crier in my day-to-day life, so I know that I need to milk that feeling, make it so real. I got to milk it for all it's worth until I get to those happy tears, because I know that's how I would respond in real life. And so if I'm not crying the happy tears, because I know that's how I would respond if I truly believed it, then I know that there's something preventing me from truly believing that it's real in my inner world. If I'm not crying those happy tears by the end of my hypnotherapy, I know I didn't go deep enough because I know that that's how in real life, the 90 or the 1% of the real celebration, that's how I'd respond. So I better respond that way in the 99% of the inner celebration too. I know that would be my natural response to receiving and experiencing a manifestation this big. Now, I'm not saying it has to be the same for you, but it might. What's your response? How do you truly respond when big, beautiful things happen to you? Do you usually smile when you sign a new client for your business? Maybe you see that email come through. You see the signed contract come through. Maybe you get up and you do a little happy dance, you know? What do you do? I mentioned that because I used to do that when I first started my business. I literally have, well, I think I can't remember if I've showed this to you guys before. I won't turn it on because it takes 30 seconds, but I literally have this dance button on my desk that I would press when I first started my business. Every time I signed a new client, I'd press this 30 second dance party button and I just dance and celebrate because I was so excited for the new client that I had on board. Um, And I'd press it and dance because signing a a new client was so precious to me, so joyous. That was the energy that I was creating. And don't get me wrong. When I sign new clients, like it still is. I I just have a business to run now. (laughs) I can't be, you know, dancing for, you know... 30 minutes each day, right? <laughs> when when new people sign up. But I, I honestly should uh, get back to doing it because it really is a fun experience. We can all find 30 seconds to dance and celebrate, right? Uh, maybe I should reinstitute it. But anyways, you get what I'm saying. If it brings you immense joy to sign a new client, if that's what you're manifesting, so much joy that you're smiling from ear to ear, then smile from ear to ear, really smile during your hypnotherapy. But don't fake it. Like, don't be like, "Eh, look, eh, in her mind, look, I'm smiling, I'm smiling. Like, you, I mean, really use your creative imagination so that that natural, real response happens automatically for you. You're tapped into the subconscious mind. Those automatic responses, if you truly believe it, will happen for you. You just want to make it that real that the true emotion does come up naturally. Now, if it's not coming up naturally, That means that you haven't made the manifestation real enough to you in your creative imagination. And so here are some ways to help you do that, right? You need to use your five senses, okay? We think of visualization when we say visualization has the word visual in it, right? We think of that most often, and we think of that as like your inner sight, seeing what the manifestation might look like. But maybe it's not the visual that gets you really feeling the realness of that manifestation. Maybe it's your sense of touch. Maybe it's the feeling of your hand on the keyboard or your hand on the mouse clicking into that email that says, oh, that client is signed with you, you know? Remember the the song, right? Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. And then we also add touch, right? Those are your five senses. Use them all. Now, back in childhood, college, young adulthood, I think I shared with you guys that I used to be an actress. And not just any actress, but I was one of those crazy actresses, right? I was a method actor. <laughs> That's one of the crazies that you hear about in the, in the news ta- tabloids, right? Method acting is intense. And it produces many Oscar-worthy performances. Um, But what's so funny is how much overlap it has with hypnotherapy and with the work that we do to improve our lives. And it's so funny to me because, you know, as a hypnotherapist now, I do the very same thing that I used to do as a trained method actor. 
I create emotions on demand. Only when we do it in hypnotherapy, we don't do it for entertainment or for an Oscar-worthy performance anymore, right? We do it for hypnotherapeutic manifestation, for universal quantum creation. You know, the good stuff. (laughs) But... The crossover is just kind of mind-blowing to me. It's really, truly insane. And I actually want to do a project someday where I read an old Lee Strasberg acting book. He's the father of method acting. And then I want to kind of read it through the lens, view all that he says through the lens of what we know about the subconscious mind, because he intuitively knew how to create and tap into real emotion using the subconscious without really knowing what it was doing to the brain. which I think is incredibly dangerous, <laughs> um, which is one of the reasons why I wholeheartedly renounce method acting as an acting method. If you are an actor out there, please do not method act. I know it creates really beautiful, amazing performances, but we know too much about how the brain works and we know how too much about how the subconscious mind works um, because we know how it actually impacts the subconscious mind and your mental well-being, okay? The conscious mind, your conscious mind knows that you're acting, but when you're doing this, when you're using these methods, your subconscious mind doesn't. It thinks that it's real, okay? And so I wonder... If that's the reason why so many method actors in Hollywood are so effed up, you know, so many method actors, beautiful, brilliant method actors, we've lost to, you know, poor mental health and suicide and alcohol problems. And it's just they're using these methods to go into these negative emotions and these negative places. And they're essentially using a negative form of hypnosis on themselves. They're retraining their brains to actually operate and feel this way. And it doesn't just stop when the camera stops rolling. No, it's their brain. They retrain their brain through this process. And it's very, it's very scary. It's very powerful. And so, which I want to highlight in manifestation hypnotherapy, we do the exact opposite on every single level. We use our understanding of how the brain works, but we use it in the reverse, in the opposite way. We tap into and we train positive emotions and beliefs, right? But I want to highlight the vast difference here, right? Because we can see the very real results of what can happen if you retrain your brain in the direction that you don't want. And I mean, when you feel anxious and when you use your creative imagination to to think through and to ruminate on all the many negative possibilities, you're doing the same thing as method actors would do. You're living in that space of negativity in your brain and it's retraining your brain to be stuck there. But anyways, I digress. There's a lot to be learned and applied, though, from method acting because you can use it in the positive like we do with hypnotherapy. You can use it in the negative like they do when they have a big, you know, emotional scene for an Oscar winning movie. Right. It's the same mechanism. It's the same tool. Right. And we can use these ideas to help us embody the character or the self-concept or the identity of who we want to be, the version of ourselves that has that manifestation. Now, I remember back in my college days, I'm a bit rusty, right, nowadays when it comes to method acting, but I remember that we would practice essentially hypnotizing ourselves, regressing ourselves back to past memories that had a very certain strong emotion tied to them that we needed for that scene. And so how we would do this is we would get on these very uncomfortable metal folding chairs, and they were purposely uncomfortable because they were difficult to relax in. So they were basically training you and teaching you how to be able to relax in a very uncomfortable situation, right? And I remember one day, it's so crazy and funny now, knowing that I later became a hypnotherapist. But I remember one day, during this relaxation portion of the class, I decided to use a counting technique where I counted from 10 
to one, and I progressively became more relaxed as I visualized myself walking down a set of stairs. Now, I didn't come up with this technique. I remember at a summer camp that I went to in high school where I was a psychology minor and an acting major that uh, a hypnotist came to our class, our psychology class, and spoke to us. And I remember doing that visualization Now, fast forward into college, thinking, you know, pretending in my mind to walk down this flight of stairs, getting more and more relaxed. And I decided to do this rather than what the teacher was teaching because I just remembered, well, that was literally the most relaxed I'd ever felt in my life. So why would I, I I mean, why would I do anything else? Let's just use that technique in my own inner mind, right? And so I used it in my own mind instead of what they were teaching at the time. (laughs) And I remember at the end of class, it was my favorite acting teacher's class. Shout out to Robert Ellerman. I don't know if he still teaches at Lee Strasberg Studio in New York, but he was an amazing teacher. And I remember after we finished that exercise, he gets up and he's this very big, tall man. And he gets up in front of the whole class and he points at me. And I was like, oh no, what did I do wrong, right? And he says, I have never seen anyone in my whole career of teaching get become so relaxed as Brittany did in that exercise. And of course, in my mind, I'm like bugging out, right? Because I had this dirty little secret. I knew that that particular time that he was calling out that I had done something different than what he had taught, even though he was a fantastic teacher, right? But to be called out like that in such a favorable way by such a renowned teacher, I mean, that was just so much fun. And I find it so incredibly ironic now that even back then, I was intuitively sensing the applications of hypnotherapy with method acting and understanding that there was something very real happening in the brain that they both shared. And considering that I'm not a professional actress, but I am a professional hypnotherapist, I find that really, really, really crazy (laughs) that here I was 18 years old doing the exact same thing. But that's what you do as a method actor. You get deeply relaxed, which we know based on what we know how the brain works, we know that relaxes the conscious mind and allows you to access the subconscious mind where your imagination, where your emotions, which are key for actors, where your memories reside. And so that's what you do. You tap in to that memory from your past that's associated with that certain emotion that you need for the scene. And then you essentially regress yourself back to that past memory. You re-experience it in detail. You conjure that emotion that's associated with that memory, that's tied to that memory, and then you can use that very real emotion in your scene. That's what method actors do. Now, you might do this process before the scene takes place, and then you go out and you film the scene, or or you go out and on stage. You might introduce props in the scene or other triggers. Now, in hypnotherapy, we would call these anchors, but it's, it's so funny. We use anchors in method acting that would sort of help you sort out that layer of past memory that you can sort of layer onto the scene itself so that those emotions are readily available to you. Now, there are pros to this process, but there are certainly also cons, okay? And I like to think of it this way. A knife could be used to cut up healthy vegetables to feed you and your family. A knife could also be used to to stab someone, (laughs) right? Like, those are two very different applications of the very same tool. The knife is valid. It's how you use the knife that determines the outcome. So this regression process, it's like the knife. It's a tool, right? Hopefully, you use it in ways that help you. In hypnotherapy, we use it in very, very helpful, in several very helpful ways. So when I work one-on-one with clients, we might regress them back to the beginning or the starting point where they learned a particularly unhelpful belief or pattern. Oftentimes, and what's kind of crazy about this is that oftentimes these memories don't really have 
much of an emotional charge to them. Maybe they weren't even such a big deal to you at the time, but for some reason, your younger subconscious mind really latched onto them. Like that was the moment that your subconscious mind was like, yes, I'm learning the rule book on how to be, even though it might have been incorrect (laughs) in that moment because you were only five years old. And now you have more resources to understand the world than you were when you were five years old. And so these memories can really surprise my clients sometimes. Like, we we could do a regression. Our clients are like, really? It's that memory? Like, I didn't ever think of that. Like, I've never even thought of that in my life since then. It can be really totally unexpected to them. But the subconscious mind always knows the root. The subconscious mind is the one that holds on to the roots of these patterns and these behaviors. I haven't even experienced it myself. I remember at the beginning of my career, when I was first starting my business, I had this block about wanting to believe that I could be truly successful in running my own business. Um, there were so many other businesses I'd launched in the past that just sort of fizzed out. And so I was really scared that this was going to be, you know, that I was going to repeat that pattern. So I did a regression hypnotherapy session to what we call the originating event, right, of that particular fear. And it brought me back to a simple conversation that I had had in the car with my dad back in high school after I auditioned for a prestigious theater program. In fact, come to think of it, wow, this is full circle. The theater program that I later got accepted into was the one where I was a psychology minor where I first met that hypnotist. In that while, that is such a full circle moment, even here on this episode. That's nuts. So in this hypnotherapy, and, you know, I finished the session and, you know, my conscious mind was like, that memory was nothing. Like, that can't, can't be the block. Like, you know, that can't be it. But I kid you not, the block was completely dissolved. I never had that fear again. Like, that was it. The subconscious mind knew. So I I share all that to say that you don't have to go back to some big major trauma in order to release subconscious blocks. In fact, I'd say very often, if I had to estimate, I'd say maybe even 90% of the time, I see with my clients that that's not the case. It's usually something pretty benign, but it just happened to create a pattern within the brain and the brain held on to that pattern until we're going to teach it to let go of that pattern. Now, There are some times where the originating event for a subconscious block or pattern or belief might be rooted in a negative or potentially traumatic memory from your past. But it's in those cases where I want to strongly highlight the differences between accessing that memory and method acting versus accessing that memory through hypnotherapy. Now, method actors are like, ooh, great trauma, sadness. Where's my Oscar? Let's relive it, you know? Use it. Use your pain, right? Like, it's some badge of honor. Like, I remember seeing kids in my class, because we were kids. We were 18, 19, 20 years old. They would relive the death of their loved ones. They would go through breakups again and again mentally in their mind. I mean, they would use these awful, distressing memories for the sake of accessing real, true emotion in their scenes. And we just, like, all thought this was normal and okay. (laughs) Like, I mean, it was brilliant acting because it wasn't acting. It was the subconscious doesn't know that they they, they were playing pretend. It was reliving it in the present moment. And that's where I get really passionate about the fact that method acting is so detrimental because there's sort of zero safeguards or distancing mechanisms put into place. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Your teachers are encouraging you to relive those things and relive them fully. And Your work excels when you access those deepest, darkest places and you go there. Like, that's when you get the most kudos as an actor. Now, maybe in the past 15 years since I was trained, this has changed. I sure hope it has. I hope that the early 2010s were different. But these methods have been around since the 1930s, the 1940s. Like, they didn't change in the 80 years, so I doubt they've changed all that much in 15. So, I want to highlight the key difference with hypnotherapy. if 
there's a negative or traumatic memory that surfaces is that we keep people psychologically safe because we understand what's happening in the mind. And that's through a process of distancing, okay? By no means will I ever have a client directly re-experience a past painful memory because they've already lived through that once before. There's really, truly no need to ever have to do it again. You know that you've lived through it. You know that you've survived it. And so all that we're going to do in a hypnotherapeutic process is approach it from a very safe, very distance perspective so that we can sort of access and retrain and release the pattern that was developed there. Because it's that pattern, it's that seed of that pattern that was created in that moment that we want to, you know, replant for something that's beneficial for you. In fact, it's a very empowering situation. I've had, you know, like I said, it's only maybe 10% or less of the time where I encounter clients who do access these negative memories and they usually feel like such a sense of release afterwards because it's like, wow, this thing no longer holds so much power over them. Instead of reliving it as it was in that moment, you get to watch it from that safe distance. Like we might watch it on a video very tiny, far away TV screen. We, we put it very, we disassociate from that memory. And then you get to be the writer. You get to be the director. You get to be the actor. You get to change it. So let's say the memory was of you being bullied in elementary school, okay? Method acting would be like, yeah, go back there. Really feel it. Feel the punches. Like, feel the verbal assaults. Like, feel what it felt like to hear those words. Cry about it like you were six years old again. Like, do it, do it, right? No. In hypnotherapy, we have to decide we well, we get the chance to decide, I'm going to bring in, let's say, my big old dog from home to this bullying situation. And then I'm going to invite my older sister here because she always speaks up for me. She always knows what to say. And so in hypnotherapy, I visualize my older sister chewing out that bully and giving him a wedgie. <laughs> and then my dog barks excuse me, barks at the bully, and then the dog comes over and licks me and comforts me. And look at you here in this situation. You get the last laugh now. You know, whatever it is. I'm making this up, right? The point is you get to decide what would have been empowering in that situation. And therefore, it's retraining the brain. It's showing the brain another way on this very deep subconscious level. And it's showing you of your, you know, your capabilities and your capacities that you have now. Because as you change your experience of the memory in the present moment, which is all that really exist of it still now anyways. Your experience of it in the present moment, the emo- the emotional charge that it has to it gets to reset to whatever you want it to be. The brain is able to recategorize it not- and now. And thus, when you recategorize it, you change the patterns behind it so that they no longer affect you in your present moment adult life. Now, does it change the memory No, this isn't eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, right? But I like to think of it almost kind of like a a metal stove, okay? So before, when you had the negative or traumatic memory, that stove was turned on. It was hot, right? And you put your hand on that memory and ow, you got burnt. It hurt, right? It felt bad to you emotionally, What we do in hypnotherapy is we're just turning the stove off. We're turning the stove off and we're letting it cool down. We're going to let it cool off. And now, if you were to put your hand back on that stove, back on that memory, you feel the metal of it, but it's no big deal. It no longer hurts. It's the same stove. It's the same memory. It's just no longer hot to the touch for you. Also, there's another way in hypnotherapy that we can use regression. There's happy regression. Now, method acting doesn't tend to use happy regression all that much because it's much easier to feel and act happy than acting distressed or having to cry on demand or act sad in a big emotional scene, right? So we didn't really use it all that much. I mean, occasionally we would, but not really all that much. But in hypnotherapy, usually it's the opposite. <laughs> usually clients come to me because they're having trouble accessing those happier emotions. And so we want to create create and tap into happier, higher vibration emotions and frequencies because it's those emotions that we know are going to be the energetic match to your manifestations. So 
there's a resource state regression type technique that I love to use with clients when they've expressed to me that they used to feel a certain way. Like, oh man, Brittany, I used to feel so aligned or I used to feel so happy and optimistic, um, but now I've lost it. Now I don't feel that way. Or I used to feel that way about, you know you know, my performance in high school or how my grades in high school. But now that I'm an adult and I'm in corporate America, I don't feel that way anymore, whatever it might be. So when we uncover that they have experienced this positive emotion and this alignment in the past, but they're struggling to find that same attitude or that same pattern or emotional space in a certain area of their present moment, this is when I love to do a resource state regression. When I hear that, it is music to my hypnotherapist ears, right? Because I know then that your brain already has the instructions to create that vibration, to create this emotional outcome within you. There's, It's already a pattern within you. We just have to access it. It's a pattern that exists within you, and we just have to unearth it. It's kind of like a a librarian finding out that your library does, in fact, carry a certain book, even though no one's checked out that book in years. <laughs> it's good. We can go find the book. We're going to go find where that book, where that memory, where that emotion is stored within the subconscious mind. And then we can unearth it. We can check it out. We can read it. We can make it more accessible to you. And so resource state regression helps clients access those good feeling memories that match the manifestation that they seek. So that they can find out what helped create that pattern and then they can apply it through so many different techniques. I mean, I mentioned anchoring before. Um, there's other ones, you know, so that they can use that and it can help them now in their present moment. And I just really love that because you don't need to have experienced the emotion in the exact same area of your life for it to be accessible to you. So, for example, you might have felt really nice and confident back in high school because you were valedictorian and you got all the good grades, but now you find yourself lacking confidence when it comes to your ability to manifest weight loss, for example. Making this up, right? I don't need you to know what it feels like to feel confident in your own body. You know what it feels like to be confident in your mind and your smarts. And so let's just copy and paste that pattern to another area of your life at the deepest, most subconscious level. This is what we can do through hypnotherapy. Now, if we were to look at other crossovers between method acting and manifestation, let's just call it method manifestation. <laughs> That's my new coin term, right? There are a ton of identity exercises here, too. In fact, it is the identity piece that I think we think as the public, the general consuming public, that's what we hear about the most when it comes to method actors. Like they completely and totally embody the roles. And sometimes they go to crazy lengths in order to do so. Now, I'm not asking you to, to lose 100 pounds for a role or to speak in a British accent for the next year just because you want to manifest a trip to London. Like, <laughs> we're not looking to do that, right? But I think there are some things that we can pull from and learn from and apply in a healthier way that can be beneficial when you're method manifesting. So let me just give you some of those examples, okay? You might have heard of this. The actor Robert De Niro, he actually worked as a real taxi driver to prepare for his movie called Taxi Driver. <laughs> so how might you be able to put yourself in some real life situations that would prepare you for your manifestation? So let's say that you want to manifest a new car. Go to the lot. Be a real customer. Test drive that car now. Be a car customer. Okay? And now, if you need to put your customerness on pause before you pay for that car, you can do that. <laughs> okay? You'll resume once you manifest the money. But really put yourself in. Do you know what that's going to do for your confidence when you show up being like, yeah, I'm buying this car? and you experience that fully, it's going to help you manifest the car. Here's another example. Hilary Swank, which who I love, by the way. She's one of my favorite actresses. She's actually my celebrity doppelganger back in the day. 
<laughs> Back when I was an actress and I was like 70 pounds lighter, so many people would tell me that I looked like Hillary Swank. Like it would happen at least once a week. It was wild. I'm not even kidding. Like people would come up to me at the mall and would like point it out. And this was like right during the time period where the, that TV show, The Office, did that episode. I don't know if you've ever watched it where Hillary Swank, where they debate if Hillary Swank is hot or not. <laughs> And I remember like, oh, my God, so many people like my friends and like even just people in class were like, oh, Brittany, like the day we got back to class after that episode and they knew how much everyone thought I looked like her. And then everyone had just watched that episode. Like I was devastated. (laughs) But I don't think there's any debate. I think she's gorgeous and I'm happy to be compared to her. But anyways, Hillary Swank fantastic actress. She lived as a boy for a full month to prepare for her movie, Boys Don't Cry. And it's a really fantastic movie if you've never seen it. So what could we learn from this? What if you lived as the version of you who has your manifestation? I like to call that version manifested me, okay? What would you need to change about your day-to-day routine? What would stay the same? How would you approach your work, your relationships, your free time? Like, let's just say that you want to manifest some genuine new friendships, okay? That's what you're looking to manifest. If you had a great group of amazing friends, how would you spend your Saturday night? Probably not alone, eating bonbons, watching Netflix, right? How 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 can you start to do some of those things that you would do with your amazing friends now, Because I bet you, you go to trivia night, you might meet that amazing group of friends there, (laughs) right? How can you put yourself in those places where those people exist now? Let's take one more example, okay? The actor, Daniel Day-Lewis, he's known for fully immersing himself into his characters, right? To the point of staying in character even when he's offset. And I think this is a great way to look at it. How can you be manifested you even offset? And what I mean by that is even in the areas of your life that have nothing to do with your manifestation, let's say you want to manifest a really successful career. The version of you manifested me, manifested you, who has that successful career, who is crushing it at work, how does she interact with her family? How does she take care of her body? Ooh. Now, this question might bring up a few things for you. I think some of us may think that your body or your family has to be put on the back burner if you're successful at work. And I just want you to notice if your mind automatically goes there, just notice those limiting beliefs that might come up, okay? Because guess what? You get to decide all of this. If you want to put those things on the back burner, you can, but it's your choice. Your definition of success at work might include an amazing, flexible schedule that affords you more work-life balance. You get to decide. None of this is created for you. You are the creator. So don't let your preconceived notions of what success at work or any manifestation might be. You get to define it all all of it. And there's so many things. I'll work with clients and they'll be like, oh, well, you can't do that because blah, blah, blah. And they just accept that thought as truth. And so that's when we have to start poking at the thought and we poke holes through it. And we're like, look, there's nothing real about this. You're the one who is making this real. And so you get to decide if you want to make it unreal, right? Or if you want to make something else real instead. And so this is why it's so helpful to stay in character, meaning be manifested you, the version of you who has attracted your manifestation, because you want to see how it will integrate into the ecosystem that is your life. Now, I remember back in my acting days, I would create these elaborate backstories for my characters, right? Like I knew my character's favorite food. I knew the... fight that they had had with their uncle. I knew all their motives. I knew all their desires, right? Because I knew understanding that character at that deep level, all of it impacted how that character showed up in just the glimpse of those one or two scenes I was in, right? I knew those one or two scenes was just a single snapshot of their life. And so the same goes for this thing or this experience that you want to manifest. That manifestation of yours is just a snapshot in your life. But we want to flesh out how you manifested you shows up in all those aspects of yourself and your life so that this one snapshot of the manifestation is just kind of like this 
final beautiful puzzle piece. It's just such a natural fit to the rest of your life, to who you are, that it just sort of swoops and fits right in. Now, I'm sure many of you all are familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza. I know I've talked about him on the podcast before. I've even recommended some of his books and meditations. <laughs> you know, I'm always going to put that in quotes because they're really hypnotherapy. He calls them meditations. They're hypnotherapy. Back a few episodes in my episode where I recommended my six must-have products, I actually mentioned him quite a bit. So I've been doing some of his hypnosis audios lately. And one of the things that I love that he does is he says, you can't get up as the same person you were when you sat down to do your hypnosis, meaning that you have to be that manifested version of you. You have to get up as that new identity, embodying that new identity when you get up. You walk differently. You talk differently. You believe differently. Key word, believe differently. You are on a whole new timeline from that point forward. You feel the shift in your own becoming. And that is really key. I get up from his hypnosis and I'm like, yeah, I'm a mother. <laughs> yes, I'm a multi-million dollar author and podcaster. Yes, like I feel it. I envision that my baby's in the other room with my husband. And that's why I'm getting to do this hypnosis right now uninterrupted. Baby's off with nap time, right? I feel what it's like to go into work knowing that the book sales have just come pouring right in, that people are tagging me online and quoting the book, quoting the podcast, sharing it, talking about how it's transformed their lives, right? I sat down to breakfast. I eat my breakfast with that knowing, right? It's identity embodiment. And so we're going to be talking about this a lot <laughs> over the next coming months and coming years because it's the most important piece. It's the piece that brings all the other pieces together. Now, I understand that not all of us have a theatrical background. This was kind of like Method Acting 101 and Manifestation 101 in one very long podcast episode. In fact, some of y'all might feel pretty cut off from your imagination and your emotional embodiment skills, and that is okay. And tapping into them just simply means that you have to build back up your confidence. You have to build back up your belief that manifested you is you, that these aren't two separate people, that it's you. Because especially at the beginning, it can feel like somebody else. Like when I was sharing that Big Brother example, it can feel like somebody else at the beginning. So for you guys that struggle with in this particular area, I created something that I think you're going to find so very helpful. It's a free confidence boosting training. Okay. It's like a podcast episode, but it's like on steroids. Okay. Like that's the best way I can describe it. I'm going to teach you how to train your brain to feel more confident in any area of your life because confidence doesn't just happen randomly or by happenstance. I think, I think when we look at even naturally confident people or people who naturally sort of believe in themselves and their dreams, we think that it's like, oh, they were born with it, right? But actually, they just have strong, built-up beliefs. Usually, those beliefs were passed on to them by parents, caregivers. But they just have these strong beliefs. And, you know, and, and, and the things that I'll be sharing in this training, I can teach you how to build up those beliefs. You don't have to be born with it, meaning it's completely learned and it's something that can be completely trained. So be sure to check that out. I'm going to drop the link to it in the show notes. It's a video. It has some nice visuals, but you could even listen to it just with audios too. But I hope you've learned something today about embodiment and method manifestation. I'm so glad to be back with you all. You can expect more regular episodes from me coming up. I promise. <laughs> I don't know if I could commit to a specific weekly cadence or like a specific day of the week. It might even be multiple times a week if I can swing it. But I'm so excited to really dive deep here in so many aspects of manifestation with you all here on the show. So until next time, I'll see you then. I don't know. I don't know.